Welcome to our chilling journey through the annals of history, where we uncover five of the most disturbing and tragic true crime cases ever recorded. From unsolved mysteries to brutal acts that shook communities, these stories are a stark reminder of the darker side of human nature. Brace yourself as we delve into the details of these horrifying events. A jealous wife turned a gun on herself as her eyes pleaded for mercy. All she wanted was the affection of a husband who had neglected her to the point of desperation. The response was pure unconcern from the husband. He willed her to end it all. He could not just care what she did or how she lived. At that point, Yvonne Chevalier wanted to die by pulling the trigger on herself. Nothing made sense anymore in her world. The husband of her youth and the father of her children wanted nothing to do with her. She was lost, exhausted, and did not just have the will to go on. Something snapped in her mind, and she withdrew the gun from herself, pointed it at Pierre Chevalier, her husband. Join us as we delve into the sensational story of Yvonne Chevalier, a rare woman. The year was 1935, in the midst of the French Resistance, a period when Germany was about to go into war with its neighbors. It was hardly a scene you would picture romance in, but theirs happened instant and filled with passion, classic recipes for love. This era was marked by social classism, but so strong was their love that they overcame all forms of inequalities. Yvonne Rousseau, a 24-year-old woman, came from a lowly background. She was raised on a peasant farm. On the other hand, Pierre Chevalier, just two years older at 26 years of age, was a medical student from a notable family. Pierre was a descendant of a powerful family, and their love could not help but raise eyebrows. The two met at the Orléans Hospital, where Yvonne happened to work as a midwife. So in love were they with intense physical emotions that their interaction was described in the judge's exact words as an intense physical and emotional craving, an animal passion. One can only imagine how inseparable they were. Their love was so strong that in just a few weeks of meeting each other, Yvonne moved in with Pierre, and with the war approaching, they proceeded to get married and start a family, with two sons following soon after. Their love was stuff of romance books you would easily find on the shelf of a dime store novel, the type that leaves the heart of the reader yearning for more as they get uneasy, burning with sweet sensations from within. The lithe body of the timid Yvonne was just graceful enough for the charming doctor, and nothing, not a single thing, could stop the raw passion the couple had for each other. Some may say that the lovebirds' relationship was not tested by time, but for the two, love was enough for them. There was nothing time would do to them that it was not already doing. Their relationship was one marked with love and joy, thriving right in the midst of tragedy and war. But tragedy awaits even the fiercest of love stories. As the French general Charles de Gaulle broadcast through the English Channel just four days before the surrender of the French, Pierre Chevalier listened. But has the last word been spoken? Must hope disappear? Is defeat final? No, believe me, I speak to you with full knowledge of the facts and tell you that nothing is lost for France. The same means that overcame us can bring us to a day of victory, for France is not alone. She is not alone. She is not alone. She has a vast empire behind her. She can align with the British Empire that holds the sea and continues the fight. She can, like England, use without limit the immense industry of the United States. This war is not limited to the unfortunate territory of our country. The destiny of the world is here. I, General de Gaulle, currently in London, invite the officers and the French soldiers who are located in British territory, or who would come there, with their weapons or without their weapons. I invite the engineers and the special workers of armament industries who are located in British territory, or who would come there to put themselves in contact with me. Whatever happens, the flame of the French resistance must not be extinguished and will not be extinguished. That evening in June 1940, Yvonne had just given birth to Mathieu, their first child, and as a doctor in training just into the final stretch of his learning, Pierre could have joined the number of people who surrendered to the German Blitzkrieg. No single person would have blamed that act or called him a coward, as the circumstances were dire and he would probably be choosing what was best for him and his new family. In an interesting move, Pierre did not surrender. Instead of that, he opted to join the Free French Movement. 
Pierre was one of about 7,000 Frenchmen who willingly followed the lead of de Gaulle, six weeks after France had surrendered to Germany. This presented him as one of the leading figures of the French's resistance in New Orleans. Over the ensuing four years that the war lasted, the movement continued to grow and gather momentum. While the resistance happened to be a passive organization for some, Chevalier was an active part of the resistance, participating and pulling off sabotage missions in a daring way against the unfriendly German occupiers. Before the D-Day in 1994, a movement that started with a mere 7,000 men already had 400,000 Frenchmen. The Allies bombed Orleans that summer in the hopes of cutting off the river crossings of the Germans that were retreating. On August 16, 1944, exactly 10 weeks after the D-Day, the Allied soldiers arrived. They were there at last to liberate Orleans, but they soon discovered a shadow government that was not only thriving, but was efficiently run by Yvonne's heartthrob, Pierre Chevalier. This amazed the Allies, as they were not expecting to meet Orléans in such a subtle good state. There was no doubt that Pierre Chevalier would be recognized for his outstanding service and devotion to France. Pierre Chevalier was honored with the French Légion d'honneur and Croix de Guerre for his heroism in a time of war. Aside from that, he was also elected as the mayor of his adorable hometown once the war ended, much to the admiration and delight of the people. Well, the beginning of their adventurous relationship may have looked promising, but unfortunately, things quickly took a turn for the worse when Pierre no longer returned the love and feeling Yvonne had for him. This one-sided affair tortured his ever-devoted wife so, and ultimately drove her to jealousy, which laid the foundation for the tragedy that followed in the later years of their marriage. Yvonne had given birth to two children by Pierre, and had been a dutiful wife. She had watched her husband play the hero, and had gladly enjoyed being in the background since she was aware that her husband was hers and hers alone. While Yvonne raised the children, Chevalier devoted himself to the rebuilding process of France. He was elected into the National Assembly and soon became a mentee of René Plivin, a fellow who himself was a freedom fighter and was the Minister of Finance when the war ended. Chevalier, like any other politician, started spending more time in Paris, as was the custom. Paris was the seat of government, and since he needed to maintain a busy schedule and show up for social functions, it was only wise to devote more time there. Yvonne, his wife, rarely accompanied him, perhaps out of respect or disinterest. She had never been a social butterfly, and some members of the Chevalier family would later describe her as a social recluse, someone who did not find attending social functions delightful. Chevalier was well-spoken, composed, and by French standards, a dashing man. He had no problem standing tall and dignified in a crowd of strangers. He was confident and had the attention of the room if he needed it. Yvonne pales in comparison to her husband. She had no social skills like her husband and was not a Broadway beauty to behold. She was plain, gaunt, and her picture at age 40 reminds one of the American actress Nancy Culp, who played the homely Miss Hathaway in the TV series The Beverly Hillbillies Is. In biographical sketches, she was painted as witless, dull, uncouth, and an uneducated girl raised on a farm who would actually enjoy life in a barnyard rather than a castle. Colin Wilson, a crime author, referred to her as gauche, clumsy with conversations and awkward in his publication Mammoth Book of True Crime. There was no doubt the couple were two different sides of a coin. After twelve years of marriage, it seemed Pierre Chevalier had grown largely uninterested. He began to treat his wife with a certain cool demeanor that was uncharacteristic of him. Mathieu, their first child, developed an illness in 1950. In a bid to be close to the boy in situations of emergencies, Yvonne moved the boy into the bedroom she shared with her husband. Pierre moved to the study and began to sleep there until Mathieu recovered from the illness. Pierre grew distant. Yvonne tried to get her husband to like her again and started reading about art and literature and dived into happenings in politics to stay informed and be abreast of events in the society. She made appointments at beauty salons and got elegant dresses to re-invite the appeal she once had for her husband. On nights they spent in the privacy of their home, she tried to woo her husband again with romance, but her husband made it abundantly clear that he was no longer interested in intimacy. "'You disgust me,' Pierre said emphatically. His coolness had become contempt. In the delicate dance of love, the intrusion of a third person always complicates the steps. For Pierre and Yvonne, the erosion of their bond seemed inevitable as Pierre distanced himself, not just emotionally but physically. 
drawn away by desires his wife could no longer satisfy. Jeanne Perrault was notorious for having many affairs, and like Yvonne and Pierre, she was also a mismatch with her bald-headed husband, Leon Perrault. Leon was middle-aged, rotund and short. He owned New Orleans' most prestigious department stores. For Leon, business came first. He ran the stores with a heavy hand and was away from home from dawn to dusk six days a week. This meant his redhead wife, Jeanne, was left all by herself with nothing to do. Jeanne was 15 years younger than her husband and spent most of her time traveling in literary circles as well as among intellectuals. She dressed stylishly, had a lovely face, and would make most men swoon at just a glance towards them. She was the perfect definition of charming and interesting. The Chevalier boys spent time playing with their wealthy neighbors, the Perrault's three children. Soon, both couples started socializing and, most times, the reason Pierre Chevalier would leave Paris to come home was for a dinner date with the Perrault's. Soon the rumor about Jeanne Perrault's string of romantic lovers and illicit affairs reached the ears of Yvonne. This threw her into a fit of anxiety. She became so nervous that she needed the attention of doctors. They prescribed drugs she would soon start abusing, like Maxiton and Veronal. Maxiton was an amphetamine, and Veronal was a barbiturate. When she was not popping pills, she was either slugging down coffee or chain-smoking cigarettes. She soon developed a condition known as hooded eyes. To worsen her condition, she received an anonymous letter. In the letter, she was informed that the notorious Jeanne Perrault had just won the heart of her husband. The distraught woman went off to search her husband's closet, where she found a crumpled letter. The letter read, Dear Pierre, without you, life would have no beauty or meaning for me. The letter was then signed with the name Jeannette. When Yvonne started to make her findings, she discovered the affair was an open secret. Yvonne took a trip to Paris via train after leaving her children in the chair of a maid with the intent of confronting her husband. She was turned away. She made other trips that turned out to be futile as well. One of such was the one she made to the National Assembly, where an usher had informed Mrs. Chevalier she was not welcome. The trips became humiliating, and after trying her best to win back her husband to no avail, she went back to New Orleans. In New Orleans, she sought out Jeanne Perrault to speak to her, but the meeting ended with both women accusing each other of moral and marital mistakes and flaws. It is safe to say the meeting ended in an ugly way without resolution. When she approached Leon Perrault to discuss the same matter, the man said he knew all about it and did not want to be involved. Yvonne's heart broke a little more than it had before. She sought for a way out of the mess but couldn't find any. Her husband, Pierre, decided to give her a chance and came home to hear what she had to say. Yvonne begged and cajoled her husband to return to her, but he stuck with his decision to remain with Jeanne. Yvonne took a vacation and went with her sons in the hopes that the distance might make her husband miss her and want her. When she returned, nothing had changed. Mr. Chevalier was certain that the marriage would lead to a divorce. France, though a Catholic nation, tolerated affairs but left marriage as a sacred entity that it was. Pierre was on course to be chosen as the Minister for Education, Youth and Athletics. He still treated his wife with the same contempt and derision. Yvonne turned to suicide and swallowed all her pills. Unfortunately, she didn't die. When she recovered, she found her way to a police station, where she got a license to purchase a gun. Her reason was that she needed it for security since her husband was about to be elected into a high office. She got the permit and bought a MAB 7.65mm French semi-automatic gun that had a nine-round magazine. Chevalier was sworn into office in Paris. The following day, he had a public occasion to attend, and as the place was not far from New Orleans, he told his chauffeur to stop at his home, where he would change his clothes. That was probably the grave mistake of his life. The chauffeur did as told. Yvonne followed Pierre to his room upstairs. In a last attempt to save their marriage, Yvonne started to talk to her husband. She began with a threat. She declared that she would take the children to boarding school and deny him visits. This did not move Pierre in the slightest. Next, Yvonne confessed that she couldn't imagine him in the arms of another woman, as she could never love another man as much as she loved him. She cried, suggesting she would change and become a worthy companion to him. This, too, fell on deaf ears, her husband's deaf ears. Finally, as Pierre put off his dressing, Yvonne sank her knees into the ground and begged Pierre Chevalier to love her. He was dismissive of her plea. That day, he broached the topic of divorce through gritted teeth, saying he could not possibly love Yvonne.
and that he would be a happier man with Jeanne Perrault. Yvonne fled from her room and returned with her Mab pistol. She turned the gun on herself, threatening to commit suicide. Pierre could not be bothered and remained emotionless towards her plight. He looked at her and coldly told her to go ahead, showing no intention of stopping her. A maid waited with the children downstairs, listening to the exchange between the couple. Ignoring Pierre's indifference, Yvonne then aimed the gun at Pierre, shooting him four times. The maid heard all the shots, afraid for her life, and fearing what the investigation might bring, remained downstairs. Mathieu, now ten years of age, ran up the stairs and saw the lifeless body of his father. Yvonne took the boy's hand in a calm manner and handed him to the maid to keep him in her care. The maid heard a final fifth shot and cowered in fear as Yvonne returned upstairs to Chevalier's room. Yvonne dialed the New Orleans police headquarters and said to them, My husband needs you urgently. When the police officers arrived, Yvonne was dressed in black mourning clothes. She had shot her husband in the chest, forearm, chin and thigh. The fifth shot was aimed at his back as he lay on the ground, dying. The news spread like wildfire and received so much attention. The story became the front page news in France for several months. Papers from Britain, Italy and Spain recounted the ordeal in lovely prose. The story was featured in the New York Times and an even longer epistle in the New Yorker magazine. Yvonne had not mentioned the love triangle in the first questioning she sat under by the police and a lot of Frenchmen were enraged at what had occurred. When Yvonne confessed her jealousy of the redhead that her husband had abandoned her for, people started to be sympathetic towards her. The trial was highly entertaining yet brief. Yvonne had spent months in detention and had grown lean and gaunt. The figure the court saw was that of a frail woman, garnering the sympathy of spectators, journalists and a judge, Raymond Jadin. The jury of seven spent 16 hours listening to the case. The judge asked Yvonne about her marriage and her family. The woman found herself sobbing as she described her husband's bourgeois family. She added that her husband's family regarded her as one of the mistakes of Pierre's youth. Judge Jardin continued the questioning, asking Yvonne to shed light on the hostile meeting that ensued between her and Jeanne Perrault after the affair was made known to her. The poor woman denied the judge's quiz about her intent on murdering her husband because the man was seeing Jeanne Perrault. You added that it would be a crime of passion and you would be acquitted, the judge pressed. C'est faux, she cried. That meant that's not true in English. Jadin wanted to know and asked what her reaction was after her husband told her about the divorce. Yvonne tried to answer, found herself stammering, and then fainted. A 15-minute recess followed. After that, Judge Jadin questioned Yvonne about the fifth shot. She told the judge that she had initially thought to go and kill herself near her lover when she returned upstairs. She said the gun fired accidentally into the back of her victim. Although spectators murmured at that, Jadin let the explanation stand without further questions. When Jeanne Perrault was called to the witness stand, she gave her information to the court, and blocking out the hisses from the spectators in the court, she stood her ground. When the judge inquired if she had any shame for having an affair after three children, she said she was not sorry about the affair she had with Pierre as she loved him passionately. The only person she had a bit of sympathy for was Mrs. Chevalier. She added that she would have remained with Pierre if his wife had not murdered him, the defense attorney shouted that her place was in the dock, to which the audience agreed. Jurors watched as a thousand people gathered outside the Rhymes Palace of Justice, which was situated around the city square. Support for Yvonne came in the form of a chant in unison, Liberes La, meaning free her. After 45 minutes of deliberation, the jurors declared her innocent, as the Chevalier case was seen as a clear-cut but a gender-reversal example of the crime of passion provision. The provision set free men who caught their wives in bed with another man and killed them in the act. Yvonne Rousseau Chevalier tried to continue living in France, but her reputation as France's first ever criminal passionnelle, the first woman to murder a man in a crime of passion, would not allow it. She joined her son on her family farm and was absolved by the Catholic Church for the crime she committed. The absolution was necessary in Catholicism, as it is an important aspect of her criminal trial for the observant woman. Unable to go on, she was overwhelmed with guilt, notoriety and heartaches. She took advice from priests around her and decided to move away and start life anew somewhere else. She served a self-imposed punishment by moving with her sons to French New Guinea in West Africa. 
She lived out her years volunteering as a nurse in a local hospital for the poor. And there goes the story of Yvonne Chevalier, who turned the gun on her husband as it was her last resort to find peace, to find joy. In the end, she lost her lover and went to live out her years elsewhere. She was said to have died in obscurity in the 1970s and today she is referred to as Cupid's mistake, a result of mismatched love. At half past two in the morning, Pierre-Emile Langelier stumbled through the dark streets of Glasgow, gripping his stomach until he reached his lodging house. It had been his third attack of stomach illness in less than two months, but this time he feared it could be something more. Later that morning, his landlady went to fetch a doctor who advised her to administer laudanum-laced water and a poultice to the patient. The doctor arrived hours later and examined Emile, who appeared to be sleeping peacefully. After a few minutes, he quietly asked the landlady to draw the curtains and said, the man is dead. This is the story of Madeline Smith and how her love letters unravel a scandalous affair that leads to a bitter end. Take a look, or better yet, stay till the end to find out what happened to Madeline and her lover in this intriguing tale of love, betrayal, and tragedy. Meanwhile, in the nearby home of renowned architect James Smith, a person in the household had not slept since last night. The eldest daughter in a brood of six, Madeline Smith, looked restless all morning but her family and servants thought she was just having jitters about her upcoming wedding. Then, 21 years old, Madeline was a lady of short stature and slight form. Despite having average-looking features, she possessed an effortless grace that drew attention among men wherever she went. Madeline was born on March 29, 1835, in Glasgow to James Smith, an architect, and Elizabeth Hamilton, the daughter of leading neoclassical architect David Hamilton. Her birth name was Magdalene Hamilton Smith, although Magdalene, named after her grandmother, was amended in childhood to Madeline. She went to school in London for two years and returned to Glasgow at the age of 18. Her life was documented as one filled with leisure. She would often stroll on Sarshi Hall Street, attend balls and concerts, host friends at home, and spend summers at the family's vacation house in Helensburg. Having everything she wanted at her fingertips, one would think she had a perfect life, but that didn't stop Madeline from yearning for something more. In the spring of 1855, Madeleine met Pierre-Emile Langelier, a Channel Islands native of French descent, who worked as a packing clerk at a city plant nursery. She was taking a leisurely walk down the street when she caught his eye for the first time. Upon learning Madeleine came from one of the wealthiest families in Glasgow, Emile relentlessly pursued her in hopes of moving into high-class circles. Despite being 12 years her senior, he won Madeleine's heart but his social status would make it impossible for her family to accept him. So for nearly two years, Madeleine kept the affair hidden from everyone. Their relationship was toxic by any measure, as they were controlling each other. Madeleine couldn't be seen with Emile publicly, but she couldn't give him up either. As for Emile, he could hardly contain his jealousy. He hated the thought of her meeting up with her friends or going out to balls, but Emile had an ulterior motive other than just snagging one of the most sought-after bachelorettes in town. By all accounts, he was trying to elevate his social standing by connecting with wealthy women. At one point, he got involved with a high-society lady from Fife, but this lady eventually married another man. Emile's notoriety came to light on another occasion when he was seen surveying which churches to go to based on the social class of the congregation. During their passionate affair, the couple corresponded through secret love letters. Madeline wrote Emile for the first time on April 3rd, 1855, but it was in the third correspondence when the tone of her letter showed an increase in intimacy between them. In the letter, Madeline begged in a very affectionate manner that he shouldn't think of going to Lima, and concluded with a passionate declaration of love for him. An instance of the provocative message was when she wrote, My nightdress was on when you saw me. Would to God you had been in the same attire. We would be happy. In the context of the period, this was considered shocking because of the explicit statement of her enjoyment in activities that should only happen within the marital bed. In another intimate letter dated April 29th of the following year, Madeline talked about getting married in Edinburgh or Glasgow, but feared getting caught as many people knew her there. She ended the letter calling herself his dear, loving wife and signed it as Mimi Langelier. She wrote him no fewer than 250 letters during their relationship, most of which were filled with words of affection, 
intentions of marriage and scandalous intimate moments. The letters not only detailed the extent of her sexual relationship with Emile, but they also revealed that she had enjoyed it and even initiated it. The couple would always find a way to see each other, either with Madeline talking to Emile right outside her bedroom window or sneaking out of the house to be with him. Madeline's parents were unaware that their daughter was having clandestine meetings in her bedroom while they slept soundly at night. Her father, who was a man of fierce temper, would outright oppose if he learned about his daughter's affair. Unaware that Madeline was already seeing someone, he found a wealthy bachelor, William Harper Minnoch, to marry his daughter. A cold dread came over Madeline. She knew she had to agree with her parents or suffer the fate of being disowned and thrown out of the house. And so she made a choice. After writing Emile a most affectionate letter, Madeline sent him the following message, severing ties with him. My love for you has ceased, and that is why I was cool. I did love you truly and fondly, but for some time back I have lost much of that love. There is no other reason for my conduct, and I think it but fair to let you know this. I might have gone on and become your wife, but I could not have loved you as I ought. As expected, Emile did not take the breakup lightly. He wrote her back, offering to return her love letters through her father to keep her from breaking up with him. By then, Madeleine had already agreed to marry William, but the fear of having her affair exposed was far more catastrophic than anything else. And why would she not be scared? Some of her letters detailed how she lost her virginity to Emile out of wedlock. That alone could destroy her, so she desperately pleaded with Emile not to send her letters to her father. In another letter, she begged him not to bring her shame. Emile, for the love you once had for me, do nothing till I see you. For God's sake, do not bring your once-loved Mimi to an open shame. Emile, I have deceived you. I have deceived my mother. God knows she did not boast of anything I had said of you. For the poor woman thought I had broken off with you last winter. I deceived you by telling you she still knew of our engagement. She did not. This I now confess. And as for wishing for an engagement with another, I do not fancy she ever thought of fit. Emile, write to no one, to Papa or any other. Madeline followed it up with another letter the next day, telling Emile about her father's wrath. Emile, my father's wrath would kill me. You little know his temper. Emile, for the love you once had for me, do not denounce me to my P. If he should read my letters to you, he will put me from him. He will hate me as a guilty wretch. I loved you and wrote to you in my first ardent love. It was with my deepest love I loved you. It was for your love I adored you. I put on paper what I should not. I was free because I loved you with my heart. If he or any other one saw those fond letters to you, what would not be said of me? On my bended knees I write to you and ask for you as you hope for mercy at the judgment day. Do not inform on me. Do not make me a public shame. Emile heeded her pleas and rekindled his relationship with Madeline in the first week of February 1857. But immediately afterward, Emile had a bout of illness that involved stomach pain and vomiting. The incident happened again on February 22nd, but this time the symptoms lasted longer. A week later, Emile called a certain Miss Perry and confided about his illness. According to him, he could not understand why he became so unwell after consuming the coffee and chocolate from Madeline. He also spoke of his extreme attachment and deep infatuation with Madeline, and went as far as saying that if she were to poison him, he would still forgive her. When Miss Perry asked what motive would Madeline have to do him harm, Emile said he had no idea, but perhaps she might not be sorry at all to get rid of him. It was during this time that he had heard about Madeline formally accepting William's courtship. On March 5th, Emile penned a letter to Madeline, who was staying at the Bridge of Allen, expressing everything he wanted to say. I feel indeed vexed that the answer I received yesterday to mine of Tuesday to you should prevent me from sending you the kind letter I had ready for you. You must not blame me for this but really your cold, indifferent, and reserved notes, so short, without a particle of love in them, especially after pledging your word you were to write me kindly for those letters you asked me to destroy, and the manner you evaded answering the question I put to you in my last, with the reports I hear, fully convince me, Mimi, that there is foundation in your marriage with another. Besides, the way you put off our union till September, without a just reason, is very suspicious. You often go to Mr. M's house, and common sense would lead anyone to believe that if you were not footing report, says you are, you would avoid going near any of his friends. I know he goes with you, or at least meets you in Stirlingshire. Mimi, dear, place yourself in my position and tell me am I wrong in believing what I hear? Answer me this, Mimi. Who gave you the trinket which you showed me? Is it true it was Mr. Minnock? And is it true that you are directly or indirectly engaged to Mr. Minnock or to anyone else but me? 
These questions I must know. The doctor says I must go to the Bridge of Allen. I cannot travel 500 miles to the Isle of Wight and 500 back. What is your object in wishing me so very much to go south? I may not go to the Bridge of Allen till Wednesday. If I can avoid going, I shall do so for your sake. Later, Madeline wrote two letters, one dated March 10th and the other March 13th, both telling Emile to get better. She reminded him to keep well for her sake and avoid getting ill again. Anyone could easily forget about their displeasure with the way she peppered the letters with sweet and loving words. They were meant to dispel Emile's doubts, after all. But little did he know that Madeleine had written to William three days later, expressing her love and affection, and informing her new lover that she would be coming home the next day. Emile left for a trip to Edinburgh, and returned on the 17th, only to find out Madeleine had not sent him a letter. Two days later, he went to the Bridge of Allen, where his landlady had forwarded him a letter from Madeline. He received it on Sunday morning, but since there was no train direct to Glasgow, he walked to Stirling for about eight miles and took the train to Coatbridge. From there he walked to Glasgow, altogether a distance of 15 miles. This proved that he was almost well, as he told his landlady on his arrival. The landlady expressed her surprise that Emile had returned so soon, but he explained that it was the letter that she forwarded to him that brought him home. About nine in the evening, he asked his landlady for the passkey, saying he might come home late. At half past two in the morning of March 23rd, the landlady was awakened by a violent ringing of the bell. She opened the door and saw Emile standing with his arms crossed over his stomach and writhing in pain. She helped him into his bedroom, but before he could undress, he began to vomit. He gradually got worse, prompting the landlady to fetch a doctor. The doctor was himself feeling unwell at that time, instructing the landlady to give Emile 25 drops of laudanum and to put a mustard blister on his stomach. But Emile's condition worsened, so the landlady summoned the doctor once more. Upon the doctor's arrival, Emile complained about an intense thirst and lamented feeling dull due to his illness and separation from his family and friends. After a brief visit, the doctor left, but when the landlady observed Emile's continued deterioration, she asked if there was anyone he would like to see. Emile requested for Miss Perry, but it was too late. Upon the doctor's arrival the second time that morning, Emile was officially declared dead. Soon a doctor performed a post-mortem examination of the body and found 83 grains of arsenic in the stomach. In Emile's pocket, a letter was found. It was from Madeleine conveying to him one last chilling message. Why, my beloved, did you not come to me? Oh, my beloved, are you ill? Come to me. Sweet one, I waited and waited for you, but you came not. I will wait again tomorrow night, same hour and arrangement. Oh, come, sweet love, my own dear love of a sweetheart. Come, beloved, and clasp me to your heart. Come, and we shall be happy. A kiss, fond love, adieu with tender embraces. Ever believe me to be your own ever dear fond, Mimi. The police soon found Madeline's letters among Emile's possessions and discovered she had recently purchased arsenic from an apothecary. They took her into custody on March 31st, 1857 and charged her with murder. During the trial, Madeline admitted to purchasing arsenic to kill vermin and for cosmetic purposes. She further explained that she diluted arsenic with water to use it on her arms, neck and face. The prosecution focused on Madeline's motive to dispose of Emile because she was bound to marry another man, while the defense argued there was no evidence that the two had met on the days leading to Emile's death. Instead, the defense brought up Emile's suicidal tendencies and that there were accounts of him taking arsenic in the past. This strengthened their position that the incident was nothing more than a coincidence. Even though her family appeared to be distressed and ashamed of the scandal, Madeline remained oblivious to the implications of her actions. At her trial, she came into the dock as if she were royalty entering a ballroom or a private balcony at the opera. She stylishly dressed herself up and wore a pair of lavender gloves carrying a silver-topped bottle of smelling salts in her hands. Throughout the hearing, she looked unperturbed as she set her eyes on the males in the court audience. She later told a prison matron in a letter that she had received hundreds of letters from gentlemen, offering consolation, their hearts and money. The jury spent only half an hour on their deliberations. Upon the ringing of the bell, the clerk of the court asked the jury if they had come up with a verdict. The foreman, in a firm tone, affirmed and announced the defendant not guilty on the first charge by a majority and not proven on the second and third. A loud and continuing burst of applause ensued while Madeline heaved a sigh of relief. She had a blank look all this time, 
which reflected her indifference toward the hearing. While the audience was collectively restless, she sat there calm and collected, as if she had no care about the outcome of her case or what it meant for her future. It was not until her letters were read that she showed a shameful reaction, holding her head down in a display of deep regret. Nevertheless, she left the trial a free woman. However, the sensational court case put Madeline in a dilemma. She could either stay in Glasgow and live with the humiliation every single day or move far away and start a new life. She chose the latter. Before she left, she wrote thank you letters to the prison matron and chaplain for taking care of her during the three months of incarceration. In those letters, she expressed her displeasure with the judge and jury because she had wanted a not guilty verdict for all three charges. Soon James Smith provided her with the funds to move from Scotland. Despite suffering from shame and distaste, she was still his firstborn. He wanted to fix her life so he helped Madeline settle in London by renting a flat in Sloan Square in Chelsea for her and her younger brother Jack. He also paid for her education at Mrs. Gordon's Academy for Young Ladies to learn the skills of maintaining composure, exhibiting modesty in manner and the importance of having propriety. Aside from these sessions, there were early morning prayers, hours of needlework and tatting, and piano lessons, all of which were meant to transform her into someone who could impress the Glasgow folks when she returned someday. Soon she met a draftsman named George Young Wardle through her father's associates. He wore a Spanish cloak and a board brim hat, and he had a thin grey beard which made heads turn in the street. Madeline was no exception, and that was how she and George started their courtship. During this time, Madeline chose to be known as Lena, a name that her sister Bessie had christened her with during childhood. Perhaps it was her way of forgetting her past and moving forward in her life. Since her engagement with William fell through after the trial, she was now free to marry anyone. George and Madeline got engaged in 1861, and their marriage lasted 28 years. They had a son, Thomas, and a daughter, Kitten. After the divorce, Lena moved to New York, where she married William Shee, a concrete contractor, some 25 years her junior. They lived together since 1898 and got married in 1911, which was also the year of her naturalization. At 90, she became widowed and moved to a small flat in Park Avenue in the Bronx District. During this time, a film company had located her and threatened her with exposure, even extradition, if she did not agree to an interview in a projected film. The interview, however, was highly suspect because Lena appeared to have forgotten Emile's first name. It was not clear if she did this on purpose to protect herself from further being haunted by her past. But perhaps this was the price Lena or rather Madeline Smith had to pay. She might have escaped the clutches of the law, but she had to contend with the image painted of her, which was a femme fatale out to possess unsuspecting men who happened to catch her fancy. A murder story on its own is quite an alarming spectacle. Seda Abe decided to take the bar of murder a whole lot higher, adding necrophilia, suicide and mutilation to the murder of her confessed soulmate made Seda Abe an eternal feature of Japan's extensive crime history. The story of Seda Abe had Japan in a cold, strong grip, and as it still makes its way into mainstream global media, it still results in intense shockwaves. Join us as we look into one of the saddest love stories of the 20th century, the story of Seda Abe, Japan's love-struck murderer. Born in 1905 to an upper-middle-class family in Japan, Seda Abe enjoyed a comfortable upbringing. With seven siblings and a fairly wealthy father, Seda experienced what many would describe as an ideal childhood. However, as she entered her teens, her mother's influence became more apparent. Seda's mother had always wanted her to be independent and fierce and she indeed fulfilled this wish. In her early teens, Sada took on the path of rebellion. She chose to learn to sing and play the shamisen while her peers were in school. These acts of rebellion led her to a rather edgy crowd, and they were consistently getting into trouble. Also during that period, there was a lot of familial drama taking place in the Abe household. Sada's brother Shintaro had stolen a chunk of money from them and ran away. Seda's sister ended up being sold to a brothel as punishment for her promiscuity, regardless of her young age. Amid all the family drama, Seda's life took a turn for the worse. At the age of 14, one of Seda's acquaintances from her friend group raped her. Regardless of her parents' unwavering support during the investigation of the heinous crime, her life was never the same. Something died inside of Seda, and as a result of this, 
she took on an even more destructive path. She chose the path of promiscuity and as a result strained her relationship with her father. Eventually, the wayward behavior resulted in the same fate that befell her sister Teruko, but this time, her father decided to sell her to a geisha house. Although Seda was sold into the geisha profession, she was not entirely against it based on her sister's testimony. In her mind, becoming a geisha was the ultimate profession. She had learned how to sing, her shaman skills were quite top tier, and her looks were also an added advantage. She had everything set for her to make it as a geisha. What Seda did not know was that the geisha hierarchy system was ruthless and quite challenging to navigate. She spent nearly five years as a low-level geisha, a position relegated to providing sexual services for lower-tier patrons without the opportunity to perform on the prestigious stages. This deeply saddened Seda, and her situation deteriorated when she was diagnosed with a severe case of syphilis. She underwent numerous distressing examinations and procedures because of her illness, eventually being treated as a common prostitute and losing the scant dignity afforded by her status as a low-level geisha. After the syphilis ordeal, Sada chose to turn on her geisha dream and crossed over to regular prostitution. Her stint in the Tabita brothel district, which provided a more regulated environment for prostitution, was not a smooth ride. Although harrowing, Sada's experience in prostitution was an upgrade from her geisha days. Here, Sada's rebellious nature flourished. She would often fight with clients and get in trouble with brothel owners. Eventually, she realized that being in a regularized setup was just not for her. She decided to still pursue prostitution as an unlicensed prostitute. Prostitution in Japan at the time was a difficult experience on its own, but deciding to become an unlicensed prostitute was a whole different level of difficulty. Seda was a rebel though. Her willpower and overall charm were enough to keep her safe on the streets. As unwavering as she was, the police later caught up with her during a raid, and she was arrested in 1934. However, this turned out to be a blessing in disguise for Sada. During this scuffle with the police, Seda met Kinosuke Kasahara. Kasahara could not get enough of Sada's charm. After a bit of haggling and persuasion, Kasahara convinced Sada to become his mistress. Kasahara provided Sada with income and accommodation. Essentially, she was set, but somehow something was missing. All the money and comfort seemed not to be enough for Seda. She wanted love, and that is one thing that Kasahara could not give her. He had made it clear that even though he was attracted to her, he wasn't leaving his wife. Regardless of the lack of emotional attachment in the relationship, the physical element of the relationship was quite intense. Kasahara highlighted that Sada was sexually charged. In his own words, Kasahara said, she was enough to astound me. She wasn't satisfied unless we did it two, three or four times a night. With such an insatiable sex drive, it didn't take time for Kasahara to get exhausted. By 1936, Kasahara and Sada's odd romance had lapsed and Sada was into prostitution. At nearly 31, prostitution had become tiring for Sada and she wanted a way out. After scouring for opportunities, she finally settled on becoming a restaurant apprentice at Yoshidaya Restaurant. It was a great opportunity, not having to deal with nefarious clients and not consistently trying to duck the police. Sada was at peace and essentially out of prostitution. The peace did not last long though, and Kichizo Ishida's insatiable appetite for women is all to blame for this. Although he owned a flourishing restaurant, Kichizo Ishida was known for his womanizing ways. His wife was often tasked with running their restaurant. Kichizo Ishida had looks on his side, and getting women was easy for him. When he noticed Sada Abe in his restaurant, he could not help but be attracted to her. Seda Abe had decided to change and leave prostitution, but somehow her path led her to become a mistress once more. After several sexual advances, Seda Abe gave in, and one of the most tragic love stories began. I never met such a sexy man. This is how Seda Abe described Kichizo Ishida. Although Seda had initially resisted Ishida's advances, as soon as the relationship started, it had Seda's head in a tailspin. The two lovebirds went on a sex rampage, drinking and moving from one end to the next. For two weeks, Seda and Ishida moved around, sharing romance and binge drinking on alcohol. The two weeks were highlighted by extreme sex romps. Finally, Seda had found someone with a sexual drive that could equal hers. Whatever Seda demanded sexually, Ishida could fulfill it. As each day of the two weeks passed, 
Seda started to fall for Ishida more and more. It was perhaps the first time Seda had truly fallen in love, a sensation that overwhelmed her completely. After the two weeks lapsed, life had to go back to normal. Seda had tasted romance, as she had never experienced it before. The problem, though, was that Ishida had a wife, and he was not willing to leave her for Sada. Unlike Kasahara, Sada was not willing to let Ishida go, even as he tried to shut her out once they were back to their normal lives. The more Ishida drew away, the more Seda fell for him. Although the sex was top tier, Seda always felt that there could be more. Ishida was essentially her soulmate, but as the days passed, it became apparent that Ishida was never going to be hers alone. That was one thing that she could not stomach, and she decided to change that. Inspired by a play where a geisha was threatening a lover with a knife, Seda decided to pawn some of her stuff and get herself a large kitchen knife. The next time they met, Seda showed Ishida the knife and threatened him. Surprisingly, Ishida found it amusing. The bravado and the entire threat sequence aroused him. Ishida decided to reward Seda and took her out to an inn in the Ogu Red Light District. For two days, the couple went on a sex rampage. Although Ishida was not willing to commit to Sada, the sex sessions did not slow down. With each session, the sex got more extreme, and eventually Sada introduced choking into their activities. Ishida loved it and encouraged it. Eventually, they moved from hand choking to incorporating garments into their sex play. The sex sessions, like the previous ones, were intense and filled with chemistry. But to Seda, it was another reminder that Ishida would never be hers alone. The thought infuriated her, and she decided to put an end to it. In the early hours of May 18th, Seda took the obi off her kimono and strangled Ishida. The erotic asphyxiation that Ishida had grown to love was not what Sada was delivering on this fateful morning. Sada had decided to end Ishida's life, and that is exactly what she did. After trying to fight for his life, Ishida could not overpower Sada, and eventually he breathed his last at the hands of Sada. Sada had murdered Ishida. Murder on its own is quite a mammoth crime, but what makes the story of Sada even more twisted is what happened after she strangled Ishida to death. After strangling Ishida, Seda stared at his lifeless body for a while as it was lying on the floor. In her testimony, Seda confessed that when she looked at Ishida's dead body, she did not feel any regret. Rather, she felt a sense of relief and a sense of mental clarity. Using the knife she had formerly threatened Ishida with, she cut off Ishida's penis and testicles before wrapping them up with magazine pages. She took some of the blood that had been left as a result of her surgery and wrote, We... Sada and Kichi, Zo, Ishida, are alone. On the bedsheet, using the knife, she carved out her name on Ishida's left arm. The room was in a gory state, with blood everywhere from the floor, the bedding and the walls. Feeling relieved that no one else would ever get a chance to be intimate with Ishida again, Sada decided to escape, but before she left, she took Ishida's underwear and wore it. Sada left the inn at around 8 in the morning. Shortly after her departure, Ishida's dead body was discovered by a maid. As soon as the media caught wind of the news, it turned into a frenzy. Details were being passed around, with most of them being distorted along the way. The whole nation was left shell-shocked, but the details of the murder were about to leave the entirety of Japan shocked. The political space in Japan at that time was toxic and intense. Ishida's murder was a diversion, and the whole of Japan was intrigued and very intensely interested in the case. Once the news of the murder filtered into the streets, there was panic. The story even made it into Japan's daily digest, but the details were toned down to avoid even more panic amongst the Japanese citizenry. When the crowd also realized that Seder Abe had not been arrested, there were multiple sightings reported to the police. As was the case with the Zodiac Killer, most of the sightings were false. It was just a public pandemonium. At one point, a false sighting nearly caused a riot in Tokyo's Ginza district. Seda, on the other hand, chose to stay close rather than escape to a different part of Japan. She just picked an alias and stayed in an inn, close to where she had ended Ishida's life. On the day of her arrest, Seda went to watch a movie and also got a message. She went back to her room and wrote letters to Omiya, a friend of hers, and also to her slain soulmate Ishida. 
On the same day, she also tried to have sex with Ishida's remains she had taken from the crime scene. She planned to commit suicide after the act. Describing her getaway plan, Seda said, I unwrapped the paper holding them and gazed at his penis and scrotum. I put his penis in my mouth and even tried to insert it inside me. It didn't work, however, though I kept trying and trying. Then I decided that I would flee to Osaka, staying with Ishida's penis all the while. In the end, I would jump from a cliff on Mount Ikoma while holding onto his penis. The police eventually caught up with her before she enacted her planned act of intimacy and suicide. What came as a surprise was how cooperative Soda was when they arrived at the place where she was hiding. She even went further to show them Ishida's decaying genitals to prove her identity. Once captured, Seda Abe went through a rigorous interrogation. She was cooperative and gave all the details as required by the police. She highlighted that the only reason why she murdered Ishida was because she didn't want to share him with anyone. While she was in custody, the actual details of the murder filtered to the public and a stronger wave of Sada fever caught up with the rest of Japan. Passion-motivated murders were quite rare in Japan and it is easy to see why the audience was invested in the case. In November 1936, the trial of Seda Abe kicked off. The media had been on the story for several months and when the trial began, Seda had a lot to say. Fearing that the sexually explicit testimony from Seda would arouse and distract the judges, Chief Trial Judge Hosoya made sure all the judges' wives were not menstruating. This was to ensure that the judges could have sex with their wives during the trial period. This was because Seda's testimony was so sexually loaded that the judge was scared that if the judges had no sexual outlet, their judgments would be compromised. The crowd was expecting a lengthy trial, but once Seda's testimony was elaborately spelled out, the trial was quite short. Seda pleaded guilty, and with all the available evidence, it was an easy conviction for the judges. After the conviction, the judges sentenced Seda to ten years in prison. Seda protested the sentence. She had hoped for a death sentence, but the court had been lenient. Seda served only six years of her ten-year sentence and was released in 1941. When she returned to the real world, the world had not moved on from her story. Dozens of writers had written their accounts of her story and were reaping benefits from it. When she came across a book written by Kimura Ichiro, which was an exaggerated account of her story, she sued him. After suing Kimura Ichiro for libel, Sada went on to release a book with their account of the crime. The rewards of her book, though, were not enough to sustain her financially, and she was forced back into working in restaurants. Although Seda saw her story as a love story, part of the audience saw her as nothing but a murderer. This even affected her prospects of making it in her new career as a restaurant hostess. A writer, Don Ritchie, described one instance where Seda made an entrance into the club and the crowd started jeering. In his account, Don Ritchie highlighted that she would slowly descend a long staircase that led into the middle of the crowd, fixing a haughty gaze on individuals in her audience. The men in the pub would respond by putting their hands over their crotches and shouting out things like, hide the knives, and I'm afraid to go and pee. Abe would slap the banister in anger and stare the crowd into an uncomfortable and complete silence, and only then continue her entrance, chatting and pouring drinks from table to table. After trying to work and having trouble making it in public space, Sada decided to take up an alias. She took up the name Yoshi Masako. Under the name, she managed to find a serious man who took her up as a mistress. Even with the alias, the relationship did not last long. The man's family realized who she was and made sure the relationship ended. Seda managed to eventually get out of the public eye. The last sighting of Seda Abe was in 1970. No other sightings were ever reported, and even news of her rumored death was never confirmed. No one knows where she went, if she died, or where she was buried. Rumors, however, suggest that she died privately, probably just as she had wished. Even after her disappearance, the legend of Seda Abe didn't die down. Several books, plays, and full-length movies have been made based on Seda Abe's story. The most popular is the 1976 classic movie, The Realm of the Senses. The movie took global audiences by storm. The movie was littered with explicit sex scenes, and the gruesome murder at the end made sure that the movie was banned and censored in most countries around the world. The story of Seda Abe is viewed in some circles as a win against patriarchy, a feminist battle that Sada won. 
On the other end, the story is viewed as a story of a stone-cold murderer who got lucky not to get the death penalty. Whatever way you view the story, one thing that we can all agree on is that Seda Abe changed the world's perspective on crimes of passion. In the 19th century, prostitution became such a big issue in America. The Industrial Revolution led to more people moving to cities for jobs and opportunities, but it also brought problems like the growth of the sex industry. At the time, women from different backgrounds ended up in prostitution. Some did it because they were poor and had no other work, while others wanted to escape bad relationships or support their families. Sadly, for many, choosing this path as a way of life ended up leading to their tragic demise. In today's video, we will dive into the tragic life of a prostitute known as Helen Jewett. Helen Jewett was born Dorcas Doyen in Augusta, Maine, in 1813. Her mother died when she was young, while her father was always in and out of bars, drinking himself into a stupor. Due to her situation, she set her mind to working menial jobs, and from the age of 12 or 13, she was employed as a servant girl in the home of a local judge named Nathan Weston. As the years passed, Jewett blossomed into a very beautiful girl whose looks brought her compliments from many people. However, life at the judge's home held no allure for her, even though Weston enrolled her in a school. She wanted more for herself, and upon reaching the age of 18, she left Weston's home to move to Portland, Maine. Here, she found out that making a living was a big issue. She had no special skills, even though she was intelligent. Also, she was now too old for another family to take her in. As a last grasp option, she took to prostitution, hoping to utilize the beauty and charm that men had admired her for as a means to support herself. This lifestyle took Jewett from Portland to Boston, and finally to New York City in search of better prospects. In New York City, she finally assumed the name she'd come to be known by, Helen Jewett. This was after using several aliases in her past locations. Living in this state was where she finally made a name for herself as an employee of one of the countless brothels operating in the city in the 1830s. After working for years as a prostitute, tragedy struck, and Jewett met her demise in 1836, sometime between the late hours of April 9th and the early hours of April 10th. While it was not uncommon at the time for a prostitute to die from the many venerable diseases around, Jewett's death was different. She had been murdered. On the day of her death, Rosina Townsend, the madam of the brothel Jewett was living in, was making her rounds when she noticed an unusual occurrence. A small lamp was burning on a table in the hallway, which she assumed was from either Jewett's room or Maria Stevens, another prostitute living across from Jewett. Just as Townsend was about to pick up the lamp, she noticed that the brothel's back door was wide open. She quickly locked it and picked up the lamp to return it to the owner. She approached Jute's room first, and saw that the door was partly open. Pushing the door ajar, Townsend encountered a shocking scene. The room was billowing with black smoke while flames licked away at a corner of the bed, threatening to consume the entire room. Quickly, Townsend ran outside to scream for help to save her establishment from getting burned down. Soon enough, help arrived, and the fire was put out. But as the smoke cleared from the room, they all saw Jewett lying on the floor with her nightclothes mostly burned. One arm was raised over her head, the other lay over her chest, and the left side of her body was charred from the fire. Upon closer inspection, there was no doubt that Jewett was dead, but not from the fire. Her head was smashed badly, with blood spilling out onto the floor, Quickly, a question arose after the shock of seeing Jewett lying lifeless on the ground. Who was the last person to visit Jewett? A man's name was brought up. According to witnesses, this man had come in earlier that evening to see Jewett while dressed up in a long, dark coat. Moments later, the police were called in, and this information was passed across to them. But before they went ahead to find the man, they inspected the backyard and garden and found a blood-stained hatchet left on the ground. Also found close by was a cloak, similar to the one the man was said to have worn. The man, who was later identified as Richard Robinson, was found at a boarding house within the area. Richard was only 18 years old at the time, and he worked as a clerk for a merchant selling dry goods. Reports have it that he happened to run into Helen Jewett, as she was accosted by a ruffian outside a theatre. Robinson had beat up the hoodlum, which impressed Jewett. She then gave him her calling card, leading to multiple clandestine visits by Robinson to the brothel, allegedly including the night of Jewett's murder. 
When investigators arrived in search of Robinson at the boarding house, they ordered him to get dressed and accompany them to the station house. But instead of taking him to the station, they took him to the brothel, where Jewett's body had been laid on the bed. Robinson was forced to look at her while the investigators observed him. He showed no signs of agitation or distress, but rather insisted that he had been home that night, asleep in his bed. He also said that he wouldn't dare wreck his brilliant prospects with such a ridiculous act. However, this did not stop him from getting arrested. As several officers carted him away, others examined the evidence they had found. Besides the cloak and hatchet from the yard, beneath the pillow on Jewett's bed was a man's handkerchief. Its initials did not match those of Richard Robinson. However, witnesses at the brothel insisted that only Robinson was in the room that night. Proceeding with the investigation, the officers picked a coroner's jury of 12 men from the crowd that had gathered to hear the news. With these men, they conducted an inquiry aimed at getting the citizens to agree that an initial indictment should be issued against Robinson. Three pieces of forensic evidence were used in deciding that Robinson should be tried. The first was the left-behind cloak, which was said to be his. The second one was a broken piece of twine attached to a buttonhole in his clothing that appeared to coordinate precisely with the broken twine found on the hatchet handle. Three traces of whitewash were on his trousers, apparently from the backyard fence of the brothel, over which he had presumably climbed to make his escape. The evidence was ultimately deemed sufficient by the jury, and Robinson was then taken to jail to be tried. During the year before Jewett's death, New York City only had seven homicides. This made Jewett's brutal murder delivered by a hatchet a tantalizing story for the press. Lurid descriptions of the murder scenes and the life of Jewett were published, with some blaming her for her predicament and vindicating Robinson. Others claimed that Robinson was guilty, saying that it was not surprising for well-bred people to harbor murderous impulses. The story spread quickly, especially because Helen Jewett was a well-known prostitute who was beautiful and seemed to be educated. Also on people's minds was how Jewett had come into the circumstance of being a prostitute while they waited eagerly for Robinson's trial. Some even trooped to the brothel where Jewett was killed. The mayor of New York was not left out. As all this was happening, two cult-like movements developed among those who were acquainted with the case. The first was a group of young men who began to wear cloaks and caps, just like Robinson was known to do prior to being arrested for allegedly murdering Jewett. This fashion style was to show their solidarity with him and their belief in his innocence. Beyond it being a show of support for Robinson, the men's actions suggested that sexual aggression, entitlement and indulgence were acceptable. They argued that young men shouldn't face threats from prostitutes, whom they considered social leeches. While acknowledging the need for brothels, they believed the women working in them were worthless. In their view, Robinson should be seen as an idol and symbol of sexual freedom rather than a murderer. The second cult-like movement consisted mostly of women who supported Jewett. This category typically wore white beaver caps with a black crepe band. Unlike those defending the accused Robinson, they didn't necessarily defend Jewett's lifestyle, but were not willing to see her killer escape justice. Eventually, a grand jury was convened on the case, which was named People vs. Richard Robinson. They returned a true bill of indictment, upholding the earlier decision of the coroner's jury to try Robinson for murder. All through this time, Robinson continued to maintain that he was innocent to his lawyers and the inmates he met in jail while awaiting his trial. A few days before the trial was set to begin, Marie Stevens, Jewett's colleague and also one of the witnesses who had claimed to have seen a cloaked Robinson in the hallway of the brothel, died. Her death led to the prosecution losing a key witness, which might have affected the eventual outcome of the case. On June 2, 1936, the long-awaited trial finally began. It had been two months since the murder, yet the sensationalism around it had yet to fade. Despite the heavy downpour on that day, a crowd of over 6,000 people gathered outside of the City Hall, where the trial was scheduled to take place in one of its courtrooms. With everyone eager to watch how the trial was going to unfold, the marshals on the ground had to devise a means to make it possible for people to observe the proceedings. They allowed a thousand people at a time into the courtroom for a limited period, then rotated them with another batch. However, this did not stop the overcrowded conditions from delaying the proceedings on multiple occasions. The trial was presided over by Judge Ogden Edwards, a veteran judge who had spent several years on the bench. 
On the prosecutor's bench were District Attorneys Thomas Phoenix and Robert H. Morris. Phoenix served as the lead lawyer for the people, while Morris served as his assistant. Meanwhile, Robinson had a trio of lawyers, Ogden Hoffman, William Price and Hugh Maxwell, to defend him. All three were hired by Robinson's wealthy employer, Joseph Hoxie. It was never known whether Hoxie did this because he believed Robinson, or if he wanted to avoid being stained by association if Robinson was found guilty. However, what was clear was that many members of the public felt the prosecutors did not stand a chance against the defense team. It was well known that the defense consisted of skilled orators and debaters, the chief of whom had been a district attorney. When the time for jury selection came, it took five long hours of thorough cross-examination by the defense and the prosecutors. Both of them tried to outmaneuver each other, doing their best to choose faces that appealed to their side from among the 29 citizens who showed up. All through the process of selection, Robinson was required to remain on his feet as per protocol. Reports have it that he had a composed look on his face all through, as if he were not on trial for one count of willful and deliberate murder. The first witness to be eventually called was Townsend, who served as one of the principal witnesses. As she testified in court, she recalled that Robinson came to the brothel around 9.30 on the day of the murder and went right ahead to Jewett's room. She also claimed that an hour and a half after Robinson's arrival, she took champagne upstairs to Jewett's room and saw Robinson in bed with his head on his arm and his face against the wall. Moving on with her testimony, Townsend claimed that she dropped the champagne and returned to her room. She then recounted how she had been on her usual rounds when she found the back door of the brothel open and a lamp from Jewett's room on the table downstairs. Concluding her tale, Townsend said she opened Jewett's door and saw the burning bed, which eventually led to Jewett's body being discovered after the fire was put out. Meanwhile, police investigators provided details about the crime scene, the house's layout, and the discoveries in the backyard. A porter from Robinson's workplace identified the hatchet as the one he consistently used at the store. It had reportedly gone missing on the day after Jewett's lifeless body was found. The porter also recognized the broken twine associated with the crime. As the trial heated up, a particular piece of evidence became heavily disputed between the prosecutors and the defense. The evidence in question was the diaries of Robinson that were discovered in the boarding house during the investigation. The diaries, whose content had already leaked out to the public, contained multiple sordid tales that hinted at Robinson having a depraved mind, being egotistical and being arrogant. The prosecutors were hoping to use it as proof that Robinson had the capacity to commit the murder, thereby further strengthening witnesses' accounts of seeing him on that night. However, the judge ended up not allowing the diaries to be admitted as evidence because they were not certified as having been written by Robinson. Shortly after, another blow came to the prosecution's case this time, the judge rejected most of the correspondence shared between Jewett and Robinson over the course of their clandestine meetings. Only one letter was allowed, and it ended up being insufficient to serve as a trail of intention. As the prosecution's case weakened, the defense vigorously worked to reinterpret all the circumstantial evidence. They argued that the handkerchief found under Jewett's pillow indicated that Robinson wasn't the only person in her room that night. The defense also presented a witness who served as an alibi, stating that Robinson had been in his store that evening, smoking cigars and reading. Meanwhile, the alleged whitewash stain on Robinson's trousers was claimed to be paint stains he got from his workplace rather than from the brothel's fence. As for the hatchet that killed Jewett, a manufacturer testified on behalf of the defense that around 2,500 of the same model had been sold in New York City. This was to show that any of the hatchets could have been used in the murder, apart from the one missing from Robinson's place of work. It took about five days before all testimonies were heard, each day raising anticipation about what the verdict could be. On the final day, the defense gave their closing summary, using it as a final act to nullify the foundation of the prosecutor's case. They went all out to discredit Townsend, claiming that all her testimony was not the real tale of the murder night. Additionally, they argued that brothels are often known as havens of deception and corruption among women. On the other hand, the defense spent their closing summary summarizing the evidence against Robinson. They referred to him as a monster and a vampire who had killed a woman to prevent her from exposing his shameful secrets. The trial on the final day continued until nearly midnight. 
During the closing moments, the judge delivered a final remark to the jury that strongly hinted at the likely verdict. He emphasized with examples that the prosecution hadn't proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt. He also cast doubt on the credibility of prostitutes, citing the nature of their profession. Unsurprisingly, the jury didn't bother asking to be allowed to go home and return the next day to give a verdict. That very night they deliberated and returned less than half an hour later with a unanimous decision that Robinson was not guilty of killing Jewett. The decision led to cheers from many of the spectators, some of whom were members of Robinson's cult following. As for the Jewett sympathizers, they were shell-shocked about how the case turned out. Meanwhile, the very instant the verdict was read out, Robinson began to cry heavily. His months-long stay in jail had finally come to an end and he was free to go as he pleased. However, despite being a free man, he did not stay in the city for long. Perhaps due to the attention of the case or possible guilt, he left New York City and headed to Texas. In a shocking turn of events, Robinson died two years later. While on a steamboat, he contracted a fever and had to be taken off to a hotel. In his delirium prior to his death, he reportedly repeated the name Helen Jewett. No other person was eventually apprehended in connection with Jewett's murder. Her case became a cold one that only came up as gossip within the city in the months after her death. However, the following year a trend started that has endured to the present day. First, a newspaper that published a front-page article about rising murders in New York City claimed that the acquittal of Robinson may have inspired other murders. In the years that followed, the murder continued to resurface in the city's newspapers, particularly when someone connected to the case passed away, or when a similar type of murder occurred. This established a pattern in how crime stories were told to readers. Reporters and editors had finally recognized that sensationalized narratives of high-profile crimes boosted newspaper sales. With this, there was simply no turning back to the old ways. In the early 20th century, a seemingly regular American woman, Louise Pete, would quickly garner the reputation of a real-life femme fatale. Louise had the talents and skills to ensnare unsuspecting victims into her ploys, and she would leave behind her a string of deaths. Amidst her chilling list of crimes, one stands out prominently. Not only did she take a life, but she audaciously moved into the very home of her victim, seizing control of his wealth and spending it according to her whims. In today's deep dive into historical horrors, we will unravel the haunting story of Louise Pete, which will surely leave you questioning the depths to which the human mind can plunge in pursuit of its desires. On September 20th, 1880, a newspaper publisher in New Orleans and his wife welcomed a daughter whom they named Lofi Louise Pressler. Later on in life, she would come to be known as Louise Pete, taking on her middle name and the last name of her third husband, Richard Pete. As a young child, Louise was fortunate to attend an exclusive private school in New Orleans, a privilege only the wealthy had access to. However, at the school, things soon went amiss for young Louise. She got expelled at the age of 15 for multiple reports about stealing from her classmates and engaging in promiscuous behavior. Almost a decade later, Louise's life would further unravel. Her first marriage to a traveling salesman named Henry Bosley ended when he committed suicide after he caught her cheating. Louise saw his death as a sign to embrace a life of prostitution, having already cheated on Bosley multiple times during their marriage. With her eyes set on selling her body to make a living, Louise moved to Shreveport, where she worked as a high-class prostitute. Here, she returned to her previous ways of stealing, but this time she stole from her clients whenever they passed out after enjoying a round of sex with her. Soon enough, the profits Louise was getting became too small for her. She wanted more, and she wasn't going to stop at anything. To make her wishes come true, she knew she had to leave Shreveport. Within ten years of moving away from Shreveport, Louise had left a trail of shattered lives in her wake, from Boston, Massachusetts to Waco, Texas. She was the reason that two men had committed suicide, and she'd killed a man during an attempted rape. At least that was her version of the story. She had also stolen several thousand dollars in jewelry, cash and other valuables, and had several run-ins with the police. At this point, she knew she had to reinvent herself, which ultimately set her on the path to becoming the infamous serial killer she is known to be. In 1920, Louise Pete found herself once again on the move. 
eager to carve out a new life. This time, the destination was the vibrant city of Los Angeles, California, a significant leap of over 1,000 miles from her previous residences. Being new to the area, Louise had a housing dilemma that needed to be solved as soon as possible. As she explored potential rental properties to get one for herself, she encountered Jacob Denton, who, unbeknownst to him, would soon become entangled in her web of deception. Jacob, who was a middle-aged mining executive, owned a 14-room Tudor Revival mansion, located at 675 South Catalina Street, near Wilshire Boulevard. He had hoped to rent his home out for $350 a month while he went on a business trip some months away. At the time, Jacob was still grappling with the recent loss of his wife to the influenza epidemic that had ravaged the country and killed thousands of people. He was now a single father of one daughter, lonely and in need of companionship. Upon meeting Louise, he was instantly taken in by her southern charm, which she had perfected to a fault. While Jacob saw the possibility of companionship, Louise only saw a potential victim of her wiles. In her eyes, Jacob was the perfect target. He was vulnerable emotionally, meaning she would have it easy working her way into his heart with her cunning manipulation. He was also rich and had a massive home, which would solve her cash flow and housing issues in one stroke. After a conversation about the rental property, an agreement was struck between Louise and Jacob. For the price of $1.75 a month, other than the initial $1.350, Jacob allowed Louise to move into his home. This compromise was rumored to have been the result of an agreement that required Louise to be his live-in girlfriend and housekeeper. She later denied this claim on a number of occasions. Within a few days of moving in, Louise and Jacob got closer and closer. Soon, she started making moves for Jacob to marry her. This was a trick she had used a number of times in the past to get direct access to the riches of the men in her life. However, it proved futile on this occasion. No matter how hard she tried, Jacob never accepted her marriage ideas, as he was comfortable with the arrangement they already had. She concealed her annoyance at his rejection and continued to abide by their arrangement. But little did Jacob know that his seemingly harmless act of rejecting Louise would cost him more than he bargained for. On June 2nd, 1920, a little over a week after Louise moved into the mansion, Jacob disappeared. Shortly thereafter, Louise hired a gardener to transport a load of dirt into the basement. When he asked why she wanted to do so, Louise painted a picture of cultivating mushrooms for culinary purposes, which served as enough reason not to raise any eyebrows from the gardener. Three days later, Louise made a move on Jacob's money. Forging his signature, she visited the bank where he had an account to withdraw $300. She also intended to gain access to his safe deposit box, which presumably contained many valuables. However, Louise's trip to the bank almost took a different turn than she had expected. The official on duty on that day noticed Jacob's signature looked unusual, having compared it with past samples that had been received. Faced with this unexpected scrutiny, Louise devised a narrative on the spot. First, she claimed that Jacob had his right arm amputated after he was shot by an angry, mysterious Spanish-looking woman with whom he had gotten into an argument. She then alleged that the signature looked unusual because she had to help Jacob write checks and sign his name with his left hand. While the story seemed suspicious, Louise's charm and demeanor made the bank official believe her. The check was cashed, and Louise was allowed access to Jacob's security box since she had the key. Emboldened by her theft, Louise began to put into play grander plans to get more of Jacob's money. She withdrew more money from his account in the bank, pawned off his jewelry and possessions to pawn shops, and rented rooms in his mansion to different individuals. Every dime she earned from her illicit act was for her own pleasure. But soon she ran out of money and needed more. Her next move was to convince tenants of Jacob's rental properties to make their rent checks out to her. Using the guise that she was his wife, the tenants saw no need to be suspicious and subsequently made payments to her. Louise also began driving Jacob's Cadillac everywhere she went and had fully invested herself in the lie that she was his wife. When asked about Jacob's whereabouts, Louise would retell the amputation story in an emotional way and conclude with Jacob being in seclusion as he was too ashamed of his amputated arm. She also claimed that he would come out of hiding once he learned to use his artificial limbs this excuse only lasted for a short while. Jacob's friends, daughter, business associates, and neighbors began making more inquiries about his whereabouts. 
as it was unusual for him to be away for this long without reaching out to anyone. To placate their worries, Louise spun new stories, including one that Jacob was on an extended business trip in various locations. She also promised them that he would return shortly and address all of their concerns about his whereabouts. While others relented on making more inquiries about Jacob, his daughter remained worried and suspicious of Louise's story. Shortly after, she hired an attorney in an effort to find her father, who had now been missing for several months. The attorney questioned Louise, trying to see if there were any details that could help locate Jacob. He ended up finding nothing helpful, as Louise claimed that she had no idea where Jacob had traveled to. However, she agreed to forward his financial and business documents as soon as possible to help with the investigation, which she never did. At this point, the pressure was building up on Louise. She was the last person known to have seen Jacob and the only person he was living with at the time of his disappearance. It was obvious to her that her stories were no longer adding up and becoming less and less believable, and soon enough, accusing fingers began to be pointed at Louise with regard to Jacob's disappearance. Rather than remain in this tense situation, Louise decided it was time to move away. Telling no one, she quietly rented out the mansion and ran back to Denver, where she had left an estranged husband, Robert Pete, and a daughter, Betty. Prior to her flight, Louise had not allowed anyone to carry out a search of the mansion, but with her away it was now possible to do so. Using the help of her attorney, Jacob's daughter hired a private detective to search the home for any details that could help solve the mystery of Jacob's disappearance. Each of the 14 rooms of Jacob's mansion was searched thoroughly. The toilets, baths, kitchens, pantries, sheds and other spots in the house were also searched with the same vigour. However, nothing interesting was found until the search reached the basement. Here, the private detective hired by Deaton's daughter found his decomposing body buried in the basement in a wooden cubicle under the stairs. It was bound with numerous cords and wrapped in a quilt. When the quilt was removed, all four limbs of Jacob were intact, meaning Louise's story about Jacob having an amputation was false. The cops were then invited, and they removed Jacob's body to the morgue, where an autopsy was carried out. The result revealed that he had been shot in the head and strangled, although it was unclear which of the acts came first. The discovery of Jacob's decomposing body led to an all-out search for Louise, all her acquaintances were questioned, but none of them could give any details as to her whereabouts. It would take a while, but the police eventually tracked Louise to Denver, where she had slithered back into the comfort of married life with her husband and daughter. Upon being questioned about Jacob's murder, Louise informed the police that she had no awareness that there was a basement in the house. She also claimed that she was not involved, but offered different scenarios to explain his death. First, she resorted to her unidentified, mysterious Spanish woman story, which she told when Jacob's absence was first noticed. This theory was quickly dismissed, as Jacob's body was found with all of his limbs still attached, contradicting Louise's earlier claim that Jacob was in hiding because he was embarrassed about his missing arm. Next, Louise claimed that the body was not that of Jacob, but that of someone whom he had killed. This theory also fell on deaf ears because, Although the body was decomposing when it was found, the autopsy revealed that it shared many similarities with Jacob. Eventually, when Louise's home closet was searched, the silver fur items of clothing and other valuables belonging to Jacob were discovered in her possession. Additionally, the gun that was used in committing the crime was found, which confirmed that she masterminded the death of Jacob. Louise was then arrested and brought back to Los Angeles. She was indicted on one charge of first-degree murder, Despite her situation being exposed, Louise never admitted to killing Jacob. It remained unclear why she did so, whether it was due to a lover's spat, a whim, or to give herself full access to Jacob's wealth. Her trial began on January 21st, 1921. Thousands of people would often fill the streets and sidewalks during the trial just to catch a glimpse of the infamous female murderer. Her trial was also extensively covered by newspapers nationwide, over the course of the trial, several pieces of evidence were presented by the prosecutors to convince the jury that Louise was guilty. Meanwhile, the defense argued that there were people other than Louise who could have committed the crime if indeed a crime was committed. They also claimed that the prosecutor's evidence was largely circumstantial and shouldn't determine the fate of Louise. In his closing remarks, the leading prosecutor in charge of the case asked the jury that extreme measures be applied to punish Louise for her crimes, 
He said, having proved the defendant guilty of a cold-blooded, premeditated murder, that she shot Jacob like a coward in the back and robbed his body while it was warm, the people of the state of California ask you, gentlemen of the jury, to find her guilty and inflict the extreme penalty of the law. The extreme penalty in this case was to sentence Louise to death. However, the jury chose to be lenient, recommending life imprisonment instead. While Louise did not testify in the trial, she spoke with the press once, saying she was being crucified. Her exact words were, I'm being crucified upon a cross. But I can say, as did Christ, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Subsequently, she filed motions for a new trial, hoping to get the judgment evacuated in an appeal. This move didn't work, and she had to settle into life as a prisoner at San Quentin State Prison before being transferred to the California Institution for Women in Tehachapi. All through the trial, Louise's husband, Richard, stood by her. He also paid her visits while she was in prison for the first two years of her sentence, as he believed she was innocent. However, for unknown reasons, he committed suicide in 1924, leaving their daughter in the care of his family. While in prison, Louise worked as a dental assistant, maintained the prison's flower garden, and wrote for the prison newspaper. All this, including her reputation as a model prisoner, led to something that was not initially possible at the start of her sentencing. After serving 18 long years for killing Jacob, Louise was paroled for good behavior in 1939. Coming out of prison, Louise got married to banker Lee Borden, who had no idea she was previously imprisoned for murder. Soon after, she began working for an elderly couple, Arthur and Margaret, known as the Logan family. But once again, Louise relapsed into her old ways of making up sinister plans. She began telling neighbors that Arthur had fits of rage and physically attacked her and Margaret on several occasions. On June 1st, 1944, Margaret disappeared. Three days later, Arthur was committed to Patton State Hospital by Louise, who claimed to be his foster sister. When neighbors and Louise's husband began asking about Margaret's whereabouts, she claimed that Arthur had attacked his wife in a frenzy and bitten her nose so severely that she was left disfigured and no longer wanted to be seen in public. As she had with Jacob, Louise began spending the Logan's money and forging their names on checks. However, after several instances of withdrawals, employees at the Logan's bank detected one of the forgeries Pete made and called the police. While investigating the forgery, police searched the Logan home that Louise and her husband had moved into like it was their own. During the course of the investigation, they discovered the decomposing body of Margaret, buried in a shallow grave under an avocado tree in the backyard. The case of forgery quickly turned into one of murder, as Louise was arrested and charged a few hours after the discovery. Once again, Louise cooked up a new story about not being involved in the murder of Margaret. She claimed that Arthur had killed her during a homicidal frenzy. She then admitted to burying her but said she did not report to the police because of her previous conviction. An autopsy later determined that Margaret had been shot in the back of the neck and had sustained a skull fracture. Despite Louise's denial, all the clues pointed to her, especially because she had taken control of Logan's family money as her own. Upon being taken to jail, Louise's husband Borden killed himself, unable to face the shame of being associated with her. During Louise's trial, there was no recommendation for mercy, as the prosecutor made sure the jury knew about Louise's previous conviction. In no time, she was found guilty again of first-degree murder. When it came to sentencing, Louise was given the death penalty. She tried to appeal several times, but it all ended in vain. On the 25th anniversary of Jacob's death, that day finally arrived. Louise was taken out for her final moments before being executed in California's gas chamber. Back in jail, she smiled sadly and once again denied every murder she had committed during her lifetime. Her words were, I have never killed or even harmed a human being, but the truth is elusive. 